This is CBC Here and Now. We are no longer able to open a restaurant. City zoning rules block an immigrant couple, couple's dream. Underground mining plans at Boise's Bay are put on hold. Showing off their hardware, two athletes from this province return from the World Dwarf Games. Well, it feels more like October out there across parts of the province right now. We have frost warnings in effect, but there's some good news in the forecast. Sunshine and warming temperatures. A full story coming up. Well, let's get to our top story. The cost of shipping goods to and from Newfoundland is going up. And the reason isn't what you might think. Yes, OceanX is charging a 4% surcharge on everything shipped to and from Montreal because of new restrictions to protect whales. Well, this ship, for example, was about four hours late arriving today because it had to slow down in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In order to protect endangered right whales, ships are limited to 10 knots. OceanX makes up for that time with higher speeds elsewhere, but that burns extra fuel. The company says these new Transport Canada rules are costing it about $100,000 a week, and that extra 4% won't even cover the full cost. In a letter to clients, the company said operating at increased speed significantly increases vessel fuel consumption, and modified terminal operating times will increase labor costs and loading and discharging cargo in port. It's hopes that the extra charge is just temporary. Well, converting a former biker bar into a family restaurant might seem like a fun idea, but a St. John's family says the city is blocking the deal. Eldon and Neela Husick bought the former sports bar on Bon Claudie Street and want to open a Balkan-style eatery, one that doesn't serve alcohol. But their dream has run into a surprise zoning issue, and the city says it can't cut through its own red tape. Here and now, Zach Gowdy has the story. When Eldeen Husick decided to open a restaurant, a realtor took his family of four to a dozen available properties. Husick's wife and two boys didn't like any of them, until they came to the old sports bar on Bon Claudie Street. I saw this particular property and for some reason it spoke to me, it called me. I don't know if you guys believe in such occurrences, but it did happen. The bar was advertised for commercial use and the Husicks jumped on it. Their dream, a Balkan-style family grill with an important twist. We don't plan to have a liquor license because of the history of the place and because of the neighbors' concerns and our own as well. That history includes being used as a clubhouse for the Vikings motorcycle gang. When Sports Bar officially closed in 2014, the bikers moved in until police moved them out in raids last September. Prior to that, Sports Bar was one of the oldest watering holes in St. John's. A grandfather clause allowed the business to operate in the residential area. All summer, the Husicks were moving full speed ahead on their restaurant. We ran into a trouble. Uh, like yesterday, actually, the city has told us that due to a loss of the non-confirming use, we are no longer able to open a restaurant at this property. Here's what happened. The grandfather clause had a three-year expiration date. So when Sports Bar had been officially closed for three years, the clause expired. And it expired in June, two months ago. Uh, had I known, I would have not bought the property, obviously. The issue should have come up when Husick closed the deal, but it didn't. Now the city says it can't bend its own rules. Well, we do make the rules, yes, but I mean, we cannot modify the rules from time to time, case by case by case. We do not have the ability to start, you know, running the city with our heart. We have to run them with our head. But Husick says the city should pull its head out of the books and see what he's trying to bring to Bon Claudie Street. Let it go. I mean, it's easy for me to say, I, I do understand that there are legal issues at hand, but uh, rules are to be written, rewritten by people who write them. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Police say an early morning fire at the Mushwa Inu First Nation Band Council office in Natwashish appears to be arson. The fire was extinguished by a band employee who used a fire extinguisher from inside the building. The quick work prevented any major damage. However, there is still minor damage to the building's exterior walls. The RCMP arrived at the scene after the fire was put out and are currently investigating the incident. There were no reported injuries. 
A planned expansion of the Boise's Bay Mine in northern Labrador is on hold. CBC News has learned Valet is putting its underground development on the back burner. Here are now's Bailey White reports. The planned move underground is on hold because of poor nickel prices. That's what prompted a 60-day review of all of Valet's global operations. That means the company's not approving any new contracts until the review is done. A spokesperson for Valet said nickel prices have been depressed for some time and there isn't any end in sight, at least not in the short term. The CBC also spoke to Natural Resources Minister Siobhan Cody, who says the review won't impact day-to-day -day operations at the Voices Bay open pit, or at the Long Harbor Nickel Processing Plant. She also says she's hopeful the move underground will happen. They're well on their way of, of the project itself, and they've been doing a lot of reviews of the project to ensure, for example, that the procurement and the engineering are done on a timely basis so that, uh, and, and together so that they can ensure that they get the best pricing possible. So I'm very hopeful that, they, that, you know, that the, in this global review that Voices Bay Underground Project will fare well. Now, Valet first announced plans to go underground back in 2015. The company says doing so will create 450 jobs and extend the life of the mine by 15 years. Right now, Voices Bay is an open pit mine, but expanding is seen as important to keep the mine running and to keep high-paying jobs in Labrador. Natural Resources Minister Siobhan Cody says she will know more in the early fall. Bailey White, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. A judge in St. John's called a man he was sentencing today a danger to society. Matthew Twine has a history of exposing himself, and he did it again in front of girls in May. Here now's Glenn Payette reports. Matthew Twine is not a man you'd want around your kids. He has five previous convictions for indecent exposure. And this past May, in the evening, he went to this dance school on La Marchant Road three times and took out his penis. The first time, Twine did it where a group of 14 to 16-year-old girls could see him. In sentencing Twine today, Judge Michael Madden said Twine is a poor candidate for rehabilitation, if not impossible. Twine was already on the sex offender registry for life. He he was under six court orders the night of the offense and breached them all, including not to be around children, not to drink, not to have a weapon, he had a knife, no drugs, he had marijuana with him. He also breached a court order to get sex offender counseling. Madden, it's difficult to imagine how he could have more deliberately disobeyed court orders. Madden also said Twine is a danger to society. Society must be protected from him and that Twine went to the dance school specifically to commit an indecent act because children were there. He has little insight into his behavior. Madden said Twine did the right thing by pleading guilty, saving the children involved the ordeal of going through a trial. Madden also noted that there is a daycare in the same building as the dance studio. After giving Twine credit for time served, he sentenced him to two years and two months in prison. When Twine gets out of prison, he is banned for 10 years from going to parks, playgrounds, swimming pools, schools, areas where children are present. He's also banned from volunteering or working where he'd be in a position of trust over someone under the age of 16. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. A man accused of robbing a taxi driver early this morning has been released from custody. 28-year-old Jeremy Lalonde Drake was arrested just after 1 a.m. this morning after a short foot chase with a, the RNC's K-9 unit. This afternoon, he was released on bail. Police say he and another man used a knife to threaten a female taxi driver before stealing her money and taking off on foot. A representative from Jiffy Cab says the driver was shaken but not hurt after the robbery. Police are still looking for the second suspect. Another child has died after being involved in an ATV accident. A teenage boy was injured Monday in Bishop's Falls and taken to the Janeway where he died. The RCMP say they have very little information and a lot of questions as to what led to the death. They say they were never called about the incident and heard about it secondhand. Something Corporal Mike Hall told CBC is very strange and a little unsettling. The boy's name and age have not been released. 
Patrick O'Flaherty has been identified as the swimmer missing since Wednesday afternoon near Keels on the Bonavista Peninsula. The 78-year-old writer, historian and teacher was in Barber's Pond with three other people when he went under the water just after 4 p.m. on Wednesday. RCMP continue to search the popular pond. O'Flaherty taught at Munn for over three decades and in 2011 received an honorary doctorate from Memorial. Well, this ruckus from motorcyclists trying to upset residents on Signal Hill earlier this week has the provincial government speaking about its plan to curb the amount of loud, modified mufflers on the roadways. MHA Bernard Davis is Parliamentary Secretary for Service NL. He spoke with the St. John's Morning Show about increasing fines. I mean, we have to do better and um, expect more from people that drive motorcycles. I mean, that was foolishness. And I mean, our department is working very hard. We've, we've had um, a blitz where we've um, stopped motorcycles and issued uh, three citations. Uh, we've had uh, increasing fines that are coming into effect, um, we hope, with through debate in, uh, in the House of Assembly uh, this fall. Fines are going to go from $20 to 100 bucks, and um, and then the top end of the fee would be from 90 to uh, 170. So it's it's going to make a little bit of a difference. We hope we hope a major difference. Octagon Pond will be buzzing tomorrow. The annual Dragon Boat Sunsplash Paddle takes place tomorrow in Paradise. That's when dozens of teams will take to the water to show their support for breast cancer survivors. The event is organized by the Avalon Dragons, a group of breast cancer survivors who are promoting an active lifestyle. 26 teams are scheduled to compete. Prizes will be awarded to the fastest team, the most spirited team, and the team with the most pledges, a mon uh, money raised goes towards supporting those affected by breast cancer. Well, we've been following Brooklyn Wolfrey from mm -hmm. Rigolette, who was competing in the World Dwarf Games earlier this month. She's back now. Yes, the nine-year-old uh, performed a drum dance at the opening ceremonies and then went on to compete and win gold in swimming and floor hockey. The CBC's Bailey White spoke with Brooklyn and her mom earlier this week when she landed in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Brooklyn, the last time we talked, you were going away to Guelph to go compete in the World Dwarf Games. How were they? They were fun. And how did it, how did your performance go? Good. You did remind us what you did uh, in the opening ceremonies. I drum dance. And were you nervous? No. no. It was an amazing feeling. It was really really nice to see her play her drum in front of all her peers around the world, and to compete. It was amazing too to see her compete at the same level she is. It was good. She did pretty well, a couple of gold medals. Yes, she did really well, and she was close to getting other medals too. She came fourth in quite a few things. So you competed in all kinds of different sports. What did you compete in? Hockey, swimming, soccer, basketball, track and field, wow. and this one. That's a lot. Yeah. And you were wearing two gold medals around your neck, right? Yeah. What did you get those medals for? Hockey and swimming. You got a gold medal in swimming? Yeah. I remember the last time we talked, you told me that there isn't even a pool in Rigolette. And you got a gold medal in swimming. Yeah. How did that feel when you found out that you came in first place? Exciting. Yeah. And I understand that there's some of those events that she came forth and she was actually competing against children who were older than her. Yes, she was. Like the running, she's 0.8 seconds off of Brian's medal and that was all kids that was 10 to 12 and she's only nine, so. Wow. And the same as like the badminton, she did double boys badminton, they had her in boys and they come forth in that. Are you happy to be going home? Yeah. Who are you going to see at home? Mm -hmm. My friends. Yeah. And you're going to show off your medals? <laughs> was there a highlight for you? I think watching hockey and her, them winning the golden hockey was a big highlight for all the moms in Canada that was in Junior A. Okay, so it's kind of a bonding experience for everybody rooting together. Yes, yeah, so it was a big bonding experience. Like, we met a lot of people. Now we got like a big list of names and people on Facebook that are the same age as Brooke that, with dwarfism. 
Well, what awesome. a great opportunity. And Brooklyn wasn't the only competitor from this province at the World Dwarf Games in Guelph. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ten-year-old Nicholas Quinn of Paradise was also there, and he brought home five medals. Four gold and one bronze. And here he is with Paradise Mayor uh, Dan Bobbitt at uh, St. John's International Airport earlier this week. Yeah, one of Nicholas's gold was in Bocce. Here he is with the silver medalist from Great Britain. Just great. So congratulations to Nicholas and to Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah great, great job. job from both of them. Hopefully they don't have to wait for the next show and tell day to uh, show off their medals. <laughs> uh, their teachers give them some leeway, let them show it off uh, in class uh, as soon as the school begins oh, again in September. You have to remind us about that. Yeah, it's you? coming soon. <laughs> Musicians, songwriters, and some of the most famous authors in one big party. I'm talking about writers at Woody Point. I'm Colleen Connors, and I'm in the center of it all, and I'll bring you that story coming up. Well, it seemed like we'd almost escaped it mm -hmm. for most of the summer, that RDF. Yes, but, um, now it's back and it's cooled down so much. Yeah, the, for some, the northeast coast in particular, so St. John's up the north coast to Twillingate, it is not fit out there. It feels more like October, but it's temporary. That's the good news. Yes. We're clearing good. out. The exception of the asterisk to that clear out is the fact that 
skies will clear so much tonight and temps will cool so much that we have frost advisories oh, uh, in effect that as well. That F word. Yeah, that's right. So uh, <laughs> a little bit of everything to talk about here as we uh, move forward. Well, let's start with our live look in Gander where, yeah, 9 degrees right now. It's uh, raining and you can see it just, uh, yeah, well, the webcam picture there pretty much tells it all along the TCH and Gander. Look at those temperatures now away and shielded from that northwest wind. It's a little bit warmer. Cape Race at 15, but 9 in Twillingate and Gander, 10 in Terra Nova, 11 in Bonavista, and you can see 14 in St. Lawrence. Work your way towards the west coast. What a difference between Badger and Deer Lake. That is really where temps start to warm as the sun has been breaking out. But again, temperatures are really going to cool off tonight as winds become light under that area of high pressure. And we are looking at single digits along the coast of Labrador. Yet 20 degrees right now in Labrador City uh, and towards Churchill Falls. Frost advisories are in effect uh, for Yes, so the west coast of the island into central parts of Newfoundland for tonight as winds will become light around this system. And you can see where we have uh, sustained winds right now, sustained at 60 kilometers per hour in Bonavista and up towards Twillingate. So it is not only f uh, in the single digits, but feeling a lot cooler than that. As we take a look at those wind gusts, still gusting near 80 in Bonavista, 65 in St. John's, 70 uh, just shy of in Twillingate. And that is thanks to this low slowly working offshore now and you can see where the rain and the drizzle have been wrapping in around that northeast coast that will taper off through this evening. It'll be just a mostly cloudy overnight tonight area of high pressure coming in and then our next low will start to roll in tomorrow into Labrador City for the rest of us Saturday night into Sunday and here is how it will shape up. So watch the cloud cover tonight. This will be the, the key part of the forecast where we see the cloud clearing basically Grand Falls, Windsor West and then up into Labrador, this is where we'll have a risk of frost warnings. And across the island, along that northeast coast, the clouds stay dominant. The winds will be in from the northwest. And so temperatures here will be mild enough that we're in that uh, 7, 8, 9, 10 degree range. And yeah, we won't see any frost setting up. Low-lying areas of central from Grand Falls, Windsor, Badger, back towards Cornerbrook could dip to as cool as one or two degrees tonight. Uh, likely hanging into the double digits for uh, most of uh, Labrador, the inland areas, uh, low lying areas from the southeast and down towards the northern peninsula again will run the risk of some frost as well. So, a reminder these are the areas again that you will want to cover up those frost sensitive plants for tonight. As we roll throughout the day tomorrow, the clouds will clear through the morning. It's still lingering a little bit through the even later parts of the morning right along the coast, but it's a fine afternoon. Winds becoming lighter across the island, and we're going to watch that cloud cover and those showers build back into Labrador City. There's a late day risk for Churchill Falls as well, but Lab City Wabash is basically the only spot. Mostly cloudy skies then to start here in St. John's. Sun and cloud into the afternoon, really clearing out after 2 or 3 p.m., and then mostly sunny skies tomorrow evening. Temperatures near 13, and again, looking at those winds to taper off through the day, but a Enough of a breeze that I think we're capped around 15 degrees right in those onshore winds, 17 just inland, and then we're talking about 20s for the south coast as well as the west coast into that 22, 23 degree range. Humber Valley included there up towards the northern peninsula, southeastern Labrador, southwesterly winds. We're into the low 20s here, except in those onshore winds in the straits, and there are those building clouds and showers in the west. We'll talk about Sunday and solar eclipse on Monday. We'll talk about that coming up, Carolyn. Great, thanks, Ryan. Well, there may be traditional music and spectacular views, but the writers at the Woody Point Festival are not your typical Newfoundland fair. This unique literary experience brings out the big wigs and tourists to a small community on the Northern Peninsula for a week of music, readings, and partying. Here and now, uh, Colleen Connors is in Woody Point tonight and joins us now live. There she is. So, uh, Colleen, what's it like out in your neck of the woods tonight? Carolyn, I have the best assignment tonight. I am at Jen Galliott's studio in the center of Woody Point. It is quite the hub of this festival. By day, it's a coffee shop and a, a, you know, a stage for musicians. And now tonight, if you can probably see behind me, it's turning into a pub here at this hour. And this really is in the center of it all. And uh, it's a real uh, example of what it's like up here during the festival. So today, I was drawn. point ever seen this place is stunning it's 
Peninsula, small inlet community fishing. But this week, it's totally different. There are authors like Lisa Moore just walking down the road, having a coffee. And then I turned another corner and came upon this beautiful heritage theater, walked inside, and there's Lawrence Hill and Lyndon McIntyre having a chat about their newest books. It's incredible the amount of talent, musicians, and uh, authors that flock to this area every time of year this, t this time of year. This is the 13th year for the festival, and there's a real buzz in this little tiny town. There's bars and pubs, and authors perform in all these different places. Uh, by day, you know, an author will read out a section of their book. Then at nighttime, you got these wonderful musicians like Jim Cuddy and Tim Baker and Kim Stockwood is performing. I mean, it really is this little nook. All of this in, so it's quite the remarkable festival. And I'm um, going to give you more of a taste of why a festival like this works in this part of the province. Why do we want to hear writers read and doing it so well for 13 years? We're going to talk. of this whole festival and figure out why a festival like this really works. And I'm going to get back to the party behind me and we'll just talk about that more later in the show. Live from Woody Point, I'm Colin Connors. Well, after the break, we're going to take you to the Geo Center to hear about how you can prepare for Monday's eclipse.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, the moon will cast a bit of a shadow over the province on Monday afternoon. There's a partial eclipse in Newfoundland and Labrador. Astronomers are getting ready and at the Johnson Geo Center, well, they're going to be holding a viewing party. So what will you actually get to see? I met up with Stephen Jones to find out. So in the U.S. it's going to be a total eclipse. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, how much of the sun is actually going to be blocked on Monday? Well, we got approximately, it's between about 30 and 40 percent that will probably be blocked off given our uh, height, our latitude above where the totality is going to occur. So uh, we'll see a partial eclipse as it's called. So it's still pretty cool to look at, but it won't be a total eclipse unfortunately. And if you're outside walking when this is happening, will it noticeably get darker? What would you see? Uh, well, it shouldn't really get overly noticeably darker because, again, it is only a partial. But you will probably notice a little bit of things going on. Uh, of course, if you do notice this, you don't want to turn and go look at the sun because uh, it's only partially blocked, so you're still going to get uh, damaging light and UVs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but you may notice what's going on. And it should occur, start to occur around 3 o'clock, and our, our most blocking of the sun is going to occur probably around 4 o'clock local time. Okay, so as you mentioned, obviously you don't want to look at the sun even though it's partially covered. Yeah. So you've got a few tools here. What are some of the ways to properly look at the sun? So what we're going to be doing is on Monday, we're going to have our, our solar viewing party. So people can actually come up to the building and, you know, get to use some of these things. So one of the things that is recommended is have a proper eclipse viewer. Now we got these from the Royal Astronomical Society and they're partnering with us here for our solar party. And the reason you want a proper one is because this will block all the UV light and you don't want to be using something that's not blocking all the UV light because that can cause damage to your eyes and you may not notice it while you're looking. Um, so that's one of the things we were using. Another thing that we are going to use here is this here. This is called a solar scope. So this is a proper telescope that is designed to look at the sun. And we have a filter right here that blocks all that damaging light. So we'll be able to use this as well and uh, we would normally have it mounted on a tripod and what people can do again if the sun is out hopefully it will be on Monday uh, we'll be able to have this here in the building and you can look through the eyepiece here and see how much the moon is covering of the sun's surface and of course you can also kind of make things uh, that reflect the light and you can look at it safely that way um, Galileo is very famous for doing this. He would get the light through his telescope onto a white uh, wall and then he could look at the stuff there rather than looking through the telescope and damaging his vision. So this thing here is called a sun spotter and how it would work is as the sun comes in we would angle this to the sun. It'll come through here and it's going to bounce off several mirrors and then an image of the sun would appear right on this white paper and what we would see is a disc and then a cutout of the disc of where the moon is passing over it. So it's a very safe way to view it because we're definitely not looking at the sun we look at this. Right, so for people at home on Monday, if they want to look at it and may not have a sunspot or something specialized, would something like a welding mask work? Yeah, a, a proper welding mask that's done to a proper grade will give you protection and you can look that up there. You can just do a Google search on what the level of the welding mask glass has to be. Like any filter, you want to make sure there's no cracks. Whenever I use this, I always take this filter off, make sure there's no cracks or anything because if I can see through it, then the UV can get through it. So that's why you always want to make sure. You don't want to be using anything that's damaged or broken because again, you may not realize that you're damaging your eyes. So this is only going to be a partial eclipse. When will this province actually see the next full eclipse? Well, according to NASA and all the sources that uh, we've been looking up just to see this, because I've been interested as well, in uh, April of 2024, I just believe, there will be a total solar eclipse that's going to travel through Mexico up the eastern seaboard. It'll pass through Canada, in th through Montreal and Fredericton, and it's going to pass through central Newfoundland between Gander and Grand Falls area. So those areas of the province would experience a total solar eclipse, whereas St. John's and Corner Brook would most likely experience probably 95% partial eclipse. So I know that, you know, I'm already kind of looking forward to it because it's only seven years really away, which isn't too long. And hopefully, you know, be able to, you know, book our trip up to Gander or Grand Falls in April, which hopefully won't be too snowy. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully we'll be able to see it because it's not often that totality passes over the island just because the Earth is really big and total solar eclipses are relatively rare. Well, hopefully the weather is good, uh, not only in April 2024, but on Monday, a little bit of sunshine and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see it. Yes, hopefully, yes, it'll be great, it'll be great. Good stuff. There you go. Extra pressure for you. Yeah. Uh, 
2024, <laughs> April. Uh, let's not talk about that just yet. Well, but, and one more thing that I should add, like if, if you're wanting another way to actually look at it is you can make a pinhole camera, which literally can be as simple as taking a sheet of paper, poking a hole in it, yeah. and then the sun will cast a shadow and you look at, don't look at the sun, look at the dot that appears uh, through the paper, through the paper yeah. onto the, uh, and then you'll be able to see that same cutout of the sun as it goes through. There's but also another cool way of making a box. You put the paper inside the box. You put a little uh, piece of, uh, of another paper or perhaps some tin foil, poke a hole in that, and then you can actually look in the box and see it reflecting. See the reflection. Yeah. There's a ton of different uh, ideas. You just Google it. Uh, do whatever you do, don't look up. <laughs> and social but, media. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really, there are going to be so many pictures. And, yeah. Oh my yeah, goodness. Yeah, now of course, this is this. all dependent though. This only works if the sun isn't covered with clouds. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about that after the break. Labrador, not looking so good. I'm thinking there's a pretty good chance for parts of the island, so we'll talk about that coming up. Welcome back to Hearing Now. Well, this year marks 13 years for the writers at the Woody Point Festival in Grossmoor National Park. It's a week of literary excellence where writers of both word and song show off their talents. Here and Now's Colleen Connors is in Woody Point, and uh, earlier today she met up with Executive Director Gary Knoll. Where you're standing where uh, I guess all of this comes from, the books. This it's is a literary festival, right? It's a right? literary festival. We're also very well known for the music that we offer, and we have some great music, and we've already had great music this week, and we will have more. But yes, we have some of the best authors in Canada, and, and actually from around the world, and these are the books that they will be selling here. They'll be signing them, they'll be reading from those books, and they'll be selling them, and people will be enjoying it. So this festival has been happening for 14 years. You've been involved for 10. Yeah. What has changed over those years in terms of it being a literary festival? Is it much more focused on the songwriter as well as the novelist? It's still pretty much that. I mean, we, we, we're kind of uh, multi-arts now, okay? We, we've, uh, we have uh, a theatrical event going on. We have lots of musical events. We have this art show going on up here right now. Uh, we've had film presentations. So, we're still focusing on books and, and, and music, but uh, we've expanded beyond just books. But yeah, we still attract writers and, and so singer-songwriters who are all about the written word. So for those who haven't been able to experience writers, what is it about this festival, tucked away in Woody Point in Grossmore National Park, what is it that makes it so special? 
Well, um, one thing I always say when people, people ask us, like, how do you have such a successful festival? I said, the first thing to do is find a spot like Gross Morn, which is beautiful and people want to come anyway. And then you give them something to do when they come here besides hiking and, you know, exploring the area. And because people want to do cultural things and we've provided that. And I think that's part of the reason. And the other reason is that we have some people like Steve Brunt who started this festival who really have a great instincts for what people are looking for at a literary festival. They want good readings, they want music, and they want fun afterwards. And we, we do provide the fun. There's lots of events here that people can participate in like that. Oh, most definitely. The streets already are packed with people. And this city, this little town, really becomes almost like a city when this festival goes it's on. It's amazing the number of people that are in the streets here during the festival. So do we want it that way? Do you want this world to know about writers at Woody Point? Or is there something to say about this prestigious little writers festival that's tucked away here? You know, it's interesting that yesterday Annie Prue said that she hadn't been back in Newfoundland for a while. And she kind of thought that when she got here, it would be full of Starbucks and things like that. And she was actually pleasantly surprised to see that it hadn't changed that much. So yes, it's changed. Woody Point has definitely changed a bit over the years. But I don't think it's gotten to the point where people are, are seeing it's just another place. They still see the un uniqueness of it, and I think that's what attracts people. They feel like they're getting away from something else. And of course, locals appreciate it anyway, but we do attract people, lots of people from away. So what, over the next few days now, are you most looking forward to? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> well, I love the musical events. So for example, Tim Baker's going to be playing here uh, from Hey Rosetta. Tim has been here many times, but he's doing a solo show this year, which is great. Uh, I will get to see people like Min Woo again, Shane Murphy, who plays at the Legion, Kim Stockwood Sunday afternoon. So uh, the music I love, uh, and I love the authors as well. I can't, I can't say one particular author. I enjoy all the literary readings, all of them. <laughs> well, the smile is big on your face, so I think you're going to have a great weekend. Thank you so much for it's filling us in. so much fun. Thanks. So much talent going yes. out there this weekend. And how is the weather looking, Ryan? Are uh, they going to have uh, some nice weather? Well, it cleared out nice today. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow looks great. Sunday, not so much. So uh, a couple of at least two nice days there. Uh, have a look at current temperatures where it is really improved in Cornerbrook. Uh, 16 degrees right now. Winds again a little cool, but a uh, whole lot better than it has been here in the east and along that Atlantic coastline where temperatures are basically clinging to the double digits and high single digits in some cases and it's all thanks to that low which has been wrapping in moisture from yes post tropical girt which is uh, uh, well off now and we have this area of high pressure which has been settling in and clearing things out uh, slowly but surely we're going to again clear skies enough tonight that will set up the risk of frost for central and western parts of Newfoundland where we have frost advisories in place and that low behind me there that was the one that's on the way for Sunday and here's how it shapes up. Saturday morning clouds dominant for the eastern half of the island where we see clear skies is where we'll have the risk of some frost for tomorrow morning for the west parts of the island and southeastern parts of Labrador clouds thicken up Labrador City a chance of showers for Saturday afternoon everyone else is smooth sailing watch the temps are again hovering into those mid to high teens along uh, parts of the northeast coast in those onshore winds everybody else into the low 20s Labrador City near 19 degrees with the clouds and the showers moving in there that cloud cover and shower activity builds in to, into Sunday. I think the clouds pretty dominant from start to finish along the west coast, though the showers will hold off until, say, mid-morning, I think, Cornerbrook uh, areas uh, down towards uh, Port Basque, likely a little earlier than that. Happy Valley Goose Bay into the showers from start to finish. In the east, uh, it's going to be dry through the day. I think uh, for central Newfoundland, it's more of a late afternoon arrival for you folks as those uh, showers uh, and those periods of rain move from west to east across the island. So near 20 degrees in St. John's, a little cooler with that cloud cover building in a little earlier for central and western parts of Newfoundland and into the teens for Labrador as well. So as we move Sunday night into Monday, Good chance of showers pretty much everywhere to start the day on Monday, but we're going to clear out from west to east. The question is how quickly we clear out. And a couple of different forecast model ideas. This is the RPM model, which shows around 3 p.m. Certainly some clearing skies across the Avalon. Better chances for central and western Newfoundland for viewing the eclipse and Labrador, I think. We probably won't have much of a chance, perhaps up towards the Straits, but most of uh, the big land I don't think will have much of a chance to see and what you see behind this graphic is the European model which shows again clearing for the island even the Avalon for Monday afternoon not so much for Labrador and again across the island across the province it's going to be anywhere from 36 to 46 percent 
magnitude, which is the percentage of the sun's diameter that's being covered by the moon at any given moment. And that is basically a 25 to 35 percent obstruction of the sun. And you can see your start times and your end times and your max times there basically between 3 and 5 p.m on Monday. Quick look at that seven day trend shows a beauty day setting up for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, some shower chances building in from west to east. Labrador again, not looking great for Monday or Tuesday, but brightening towards the end of the week. It's time now for our young athlete of the day and today's spotlight is on Nora Tucker, Tucker Hounsel of Trinity. Nora is four years old and skates with the frosty figures in Centerville. Awesome job Nora, you're today's young athlete of the day. Good body of research evidence that shows that standing a lot is actually bad for health. Well we've all heard about the health warnings about sitting too much, a new study suggests standing isn't much better. We'll have more on that story right after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now. Sitting is not healthy, and now it appears too much standing may not be great either. A new study published in the American Journal of Epidemiology found spending most of your day on your feet can be bad for your heart. Health reporter Christine Birak explains. I t tend to stand. But she can crank it down and take a seat if she wants to. Others don't have much of a choice. They either sit most of their workday or they're on their feet. So which is worse for your health? I would say sitting, definitely. Well, if you spend four to five hours of your workday standing, you may want to take a seat for this. Researchers tracked 7,300 Ontario workers aged 35 to 74 for 12 years and found those who primarily stand on the job were twice as likely to have heart disease than those who mainly sit. There's a good body of research evidence that shows that standing a lot is actually bad for your health. So there are things like blood pooling in your legs, um, the venous return, the pressure on your body to pump blood back up to your heart from your legs, and that can lead to increases in oxidative stress, which can increase your risk of heart disease. Researchers went as far as to say standing on the job puts people at a higher risk for heart disease than smoking. We're trying to prevent damage to the heart muscle. But this cardiologist points out the study didn't account for how active people were outside of work. 
or their work environment. We know from lots of scientific evidence that workplace stress, psychosocial stress, um, can actually impact on our health and health outcomes. And unfortunately, that was not factored into the analysis. But doctors and researchers do agree that movement is the key. Workers who stand for hours on end need breaks to sit. And those who sit, well, doctors recommend they get up and walk around at least every 30 minutes, meaning a standing desk isn't exactly the answer. There are lots of ways to move beyond standing desks. And we know that light activity step counts, for example, the 10,000 steps do have some relationship with uh, health outcomes, as does exercise. So while standing isn't quite the new smoking, experts say a change of pace can go a long way toward protecting your heart. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Well, after yesterday's tragedy, the world is sending love to Barcelona. Toronto's iconic sign was lit up with the Spanish colors of red and yellow, a show of solidarity with the victims of the attack. Last night at Montreal's City Hall, the flags were lowered to half-mast. In Paris, the Eiffel Tower went dark, as it's done so many times before in the past following similar tragedies. Tel Aviv and New York also lit up their skylines with the Spanish colors. While the world is showing its support for the people of Barcelona, the residents themselves are also banding together today, standing up to the attempts to terrorize them. The King of Spain joined a huge crowd in the centre of the city. There was one minute of silence, then a burst of applause in a show of solidarity with the 14 victims of the two attacks. The crowd chanted, I am not afraid. Four people are under arrest for the van attack in Barcelona. Hours later, there was a second incident in a small town west of the city. Police shot and killed five people whose vehicle had rammed a crowd there. Authorities say the attacks had clearly been planned for some time. Welcome back to Here and Now with all the talk of the eclipse happening. Well, you know that there had to be a parody not far behind. Have a look. Dark, 
<laughs> yep, sunglass manufacturer Warby Parker has reworked Bonnie Tyler's Total Eclipse of the Heart into something a little more topical. The company has also been giving away free Eclipse glasses at its stores. <laughs> I don't know where you can pick up those costumes for your Eclipse party on Monday, but... People have already driven to, they started lining up on the roads in Oregon already because it's a very good chance the skies will be clear there. And there have been lots of people from Newfoundland and Labrador even who've uh, flown down to uh, Denver, Wyoming, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, lots of excited people. Well, what's a bear to do on a stifling hot day with that thick fur coat? Oh, this, of course, the choice was easy for this beast in Montana. He took a refreshing dip in a serene backyard koi pond. Uh, you'd think he'd feast on the fish, but he, uh, he let them be, actually, happily munching on plants instead and enjoying, I have to say, the bare necessities of life. Aww. Aww. <laughs> nice. Well, it's Friday, so it's time to find out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 70th anniversary to Willis and Mary Clark of Mount Pearl. Happy anniversary to Barbet and Bowen of St. John's who will be celebrating their 50th anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations to Bill and Blanche Holland of St. John's who are celebrating 66 years of marriage. Happy 95th birthday to Dallas Rose of St. John's. Here she is with her great-grandchildren. Happy 50th anniversary to Alec and Goldie Garland of Waterville. Happy 58th anniversary to Betty and Bob French of Coley's Point, Conception Bay, now living in Clark's Beach. Sandra and Gordon Saunders of Harbor Rock Hill in Carboneer celebrated 50 years of marriage on August 11th. Congratulations. Happy 67th anniversary to Donald and Florence Bercy, formerly of Buckins, now in Grand Falls, Windsor. Congratulations to Bramwell and Margaret Flight of Cottlesville, Notre Dame Bay, who celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary on Tuesday. And here's a milestone birthday. Happy 100th birthday to Mary Bridget Ford. We're told she had a big party earlier this month with 125 family and friends. Another special triple digit birthday to tell you about. Elizabeth Williams of Lewisport turned 100 this past Tuesday. Congratulations to Herb and Shirley Blundell of Hickman's Harbor. They're celebrating their 55th anniversary. Happy 60th anniversary to Roy and Shirley Hodder of Gander. Best wishes from friends and family. It's a golden anniversary for Bruce and Annie Bailey. They celebrated 50 years of marriage. Happy 57th wedding anniversary to Rendell and Rosie House from Hawks Bay, now living in Pasadena. They celebrated on Tuesday. Happy 98th birthday tomorrow to Phoebe Bonnell of Pasadena. Congratulations to Charlie and Eva Gilbert from Fortune. They're celebrating 62 years of marriage. Happy 60th anniversary to Minnie and Stead Mercer of West Pond. Happy, happy 62nd wedding anniversary to Max and Doris Simmons of Mount Pearl. Happy 90th birthday to Mary Agnes Pike. Happy 54th anniversary to Ruth and Ern Cluett. They celebrated yesterday. Happy 58th anniversary to Lorne and Marjorie Critch of Hans Harbor, now living in Mount Pearl. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Cal and Edwina Snow. Happy birthday going out to Marcella Pittman of Placentia, who turns 97 on August 22nd. Happy 50th wedding anniversary tomorrow to Lawrence and Betty Butler of St. Mary's. Happy 95th birthday to Rita Foss of Springdale, who will be celebrating on August 21st. Happy 50th anniversary to Hubert and Lavinia Hodder of Davidsville. Birthday greetings to Rhoda Barrett from Old Perlican, who celebrated her 95th birthday on August 15th. Here's another big birthday. Happy 100th birthday to Don Harvey of Freshwater, now living in Paradise. Happy 90th birthday tomorrow to Hector Barnes in Paradise. His friends call him the oldest teenager in Newfoundland. George and Lizzie Blanche of Jersey Side are celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Happy 55th anniversary to Nick and Francis Philpot of Mount Pearl. It's 56 years of marriage for George and Maisie Osmond. Congratulations. Happy 66th anniversary today to Anne and Abel Clark. Happy 64th anniversary to Herbert and Linda Vincent of Cornerbrook. Happy 50th anniversary to Jordan and Margaret Thornhill. 
Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Raymond and Gladys Payne of Stephenville, who will celebrate tomorrow. Ted and Marg Everson of Flat Rock will celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Also celebrating tomorrow are Doug and Elsie Wells of Mount Pearl. It's their 50th anniversary. Happy 58th anniversary tomorrow to Onslow and Shirley Hiller of Grand Bank. Happy 60th anniversary to Clara and Irving Wareham of Carboneer, now living in paradise. Happy birthday to Alfreda Daly of Twillingate, now living in St. John's. She turns 95 on Sunday. Ms. Audrey Grandy of Garnish turned 90 on August 16th. Happy 96th birthday to Garfield Francis. We're told he's the oldest resident of Burnt Islands on the Southwest Coast. Congratulations. No disrespect to any of the other folks celebrating, but have you seen a sharper dressed man than Garfield? I mean, fantastic. Maybe the sharpest dressed all year on uh, the birthdays and anniversaries. Big, big uh, uh, celebration there for Garfield. Uh, congrats to you and congrats to everybody, of course. Uh, have a look, quick uh, recap of the next three days. You can see where uh, tomorrow looks great. We're certainly building the clouds and showers in Sunday, uh, clearing out Monday, and we hope enough for the eclipse. And this picture is so fantastic. Look, you can actually see the capelin that escaped the oh, mouth wow. of that whale. Very lucky capelin. Yes, uh, until the next pass. <laughs> but uh, what a picture. Michael Windsor, thank you so much. Having a feed. Well, that's it for us. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. Yes.